Okay, so we're talking about parable teaching, the method by which one uses the natural things to explain the spiritual. And we left off in Christ Object Lessons, chapter one, paragraph one, sentence one, okay? And so, in the opening sentence of the opening chapter of Christ Object Lessons, Ellen G. White opens up one of the most profound truths on the nature of Christ that we need to understand. If we had approached the subject of the nature of Christ's humanity and therefore the nature of our humanity through parables like Ellen White is telling us to, we wouldn't have any arguments. We would understand what the human and divine nature of Christ was, how it works when the Bible says, it would come in the likeness of sinful flesh. We would know what that meant. Parables teach it easily. Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh. What part of the human being is sinful? <laughs> yes, the, the, the outside, the body, the physical, right? Sorry. The, oh, the, okay, so, yeah, so what part of the human um, being is sinful? We know it's humanity. So I would ask the humanity or divinity, it's the humanity. It's the humanity that's sinful, which is sinful, the heart or body. The body is sinful. The heart is as referred to as the mind, is referred to as the mind, is divine. It's spiritual. If Christ's mind was sinful, if he had a fallen nature, a sinful nature, what would this look like? Anyone? This up here. Yes, it would look like human and human. Human on the inside, human on the outside. We also look at this as unconverted, right? Okay. This is not a parable. So you know that the inner man of Christ must have been spiritual and divine. And that would be the middle one here. Spiritual on the inside, human on the outside. Human, humanity and divinity combined, which is a parable. Natural and the spiritual. And this actually took me to Psalms 51, verses 5 through 7, which says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So Christ came to us in parable, right? in humanity and divinity, we were born in this, right? He wants us to become like him, a parable. Humanity makes with divinity, one with him, right? So that's what he is calling us to be. And Psalm 51 clearly expresses that. So the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When we were born, we look like human on the inside and human on the outside. The Bible wants to change our mind. It doesn't want to change our bodies. He says, change your mind because if, if our body changes, people would come and worship us like we're gods. Why? Because we will look like this. Divinity, completely. Spiritual on the inside, spiritual on the outside, right? Full blown divinity. And that will cause people to want to worship us because they will see us as gods, right? And that would, and that would be worshiped through fear or idolatry. And God does not want that. So he cannot change our bodies now, right? That's why we are defective and still have disease. Though you may go through the, the transformation of a new heart, your bodies are still going to be in that humanity now, right? 
You're not going to have a new body right now, that new body here. This is because, sorry, where am I? Right. This is because he cannot explain heaven. If he made our bodies divine, both models won't work. The human inside and out and the divine inside and out because of the set principle of parables. God keeps these rules because he is one who lives what he thinks and practices what he preaches. Does that make sense? Um, and please, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free anytime. We are born human on the inside and human on the outside. In heaven, we will look like divinity on the inside and divinity on the outside. Neither of these are parables. In between them is where we should be today. This, right? Sorry. Human on the outside and divine on the inside. As Paul says, living epistles, books, or living books, living letters, is the condition we should live in today. What does it mean to be a living letter? Anyone? A walking epistle? Amen. It means a combination of divinity and humanity, divine and the natural. On the outside, we are human, and on the inside, we are divine. Parable. This, is, this was the same condition Jesus was in. So, then that took me to coming to understand this. I'm going to write this here. The corruptible. Seed. The incorruptible seed, the overcomer, right? This is the incorruptible seed. This is, sorry, this is the corruptible seed. This is the incorruptible seed, and this is the overcomer, right? And I'm going to explain that, what I mean by that. We have here the corruptible seed, the old man in the physical body. Here in the incorruptible seed, you have the new man in the physical, still in the human body. The overcomer is the new man in a glorified body. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is when, so what does it look like when you're unconverted? What is that? What is the na have any one of you been introduced to the nature of man study? So you have the higher powers, right? And you have the lower passions. And this condition, which is a sinful condition, you have the lower passions controlling the higher powers, right? In this condition, the human and divinity, you have the higher powers controlling the lower passions. That is conversion. That is the way we should be living in now. And not only that, you will continue to live that way in heaven in a divine body, right? So we are to be perfect right now. And this is what perfection looks like, higher powers, over the lower pa passions, okay? So, sinful condition, sinless condition, oops, huh? Okay, and Basically, it's still still this condition. All right. So, when I spoke about this, I can't remember if it was last Sabbath or not. Someone, and I brought up the corruptible 
and the incorruptible. And someone went, mm mm. And so it made me think like, I, I know what I'm saying. I understand what I'm saying. It made me rethink about some of the things that I was saying. And that individual actually began to understand what I was saying when I further explained myself. And so then I, look, I went back to look it up because there's multiple places or a few places, that, uh, yeah, I would just say a few that I know of, where the corruptible and the incorruptible is talked about. But I'm referring to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Okay. Can someone read that out to me? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. I want to write that up here real quick because I want to illustrate something. Nobody needs this, right? Sorry. First Peter chapter one verse twenty three. It begins with the word "born again." Being born again. Thank you. Read it uh, slowly, please, because I, I want to write it down. Being born again. And and tell me punctuation, please, too. Thank you. And not of corruptible seed. Okay, hold on. But of incorruptible. Okay. By the word of God. Which liveth. Why am I liveth? Liveth and abideth forever. All right, thank you so much for reading that. I'm going to circle this. I'm going to square this. Sorry. So being born again, corrupt, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we're going to break this down. Okay. So we have. Okay, so what is incorruptible seed? I mean, so actually, based off of corruptible seed, we know that what? This is also incorruptible seed, right? So we have, we're gonna do a chiasm here. I wrote too big again, but I'm gonna try to fit it here. Okay, so we have, uh, should I write it here or hmm. I probably, I don't know where I should write it, but I'm going to just write it here and then I'll see if this makes sense. So this is corruptible seed. We know that this has to be incorruptible seed.
What is incorruptible? Seed. What is the incorruptible seed? It's in this sentence here. Anyone else? The word of God. Amen. The word of God. Incorruptible seed. I'm oh, sorry. Yes, incorruptible seed is the word of God. So what is the corruptible seed? Okay, word of man. What's another word for word of God? Okay, Bible. What's another word? Truth, right? So if you're going to say Bible, we can say what? False doctrine, right? And um, if we're going to say truth, we can say what? Do you mean under oh, oh, sorry. What did I do? Oh, I'm so sorry. Not paying attention. Thank you. Ah. Uh, false. Uh, sorry. What am I doing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Word of man. False doctrine. And error. Sorry about that. What did I just ask? Can anyone remind me? What did I just ask before that? Okay, so where am I going with this? Um, I lost my train of thought. That's what the opposite of truth was. Mm hmm. So fair. Right. Okay. But there was somewhere where I was going with that. Okay. So we know that this is, the incorruptible seed is the word of God. We know it's the Bible. We know it's the truth. We know that corruptible seed must be the word of man, false doctrine, or error. And so what does the incorruptible seed do? What does the word of God, what should it do? It changes us, right? We have conversion here. It change, well, we can have a transformation here. So we have... Uh, conversion or change. This one, what do we have? No conversion. Wait, sorry. I messed up. Wrong side. No, that is the right side. Oh, okay. So, we have change, conversion, No change, Saying, staying the same, or, no conversion. yeah, no conversion. You just get worse, okay? And so, therefore, we see that the theme between these two subjects is what? Being born again. Being, and what is being born again? Conversion, right? Yes, new creature, conversion. So therefore, this relates, the incorruptible seed does relate, and corruptible seed, we, how about this, how about this? What do you see when I write this down here? What can someone tell me? What do they understand from this and this? From the sentence or from a fun topic group? From this chiasm, yes, and then when you lay it out like that. We see a thread. Yes, you see a connection between being born again with corruptible seed and incorruptible seed. And so you know that in order to be born again, you need the word of God, right? The word of God is what causes this um, transformation. It's the word of God that changes you. Right? And so what is the word of God? We talked about this earlier. Yes, the truth. Or what is behind, amen. What is his thoughts combined of? His mind, right? So you have his mind in you. Amen? Okay. Whew, thank you, Lord, for getting me through that. Does that make sense? 
when you use the word and seed? Huh? Because it says um, incorruptible seed, and then you have by the word of God. So that's like symbolic too. It's like spiritual. You know, it's a word. The word is actually a seed. Yes. You mean like? I mean. Yeah. yeah, it is symbolic. There is a symbolic, um, but yeah, sense, so. yeah, okay. So does that make sense to everyone how we can apply um, this to be in the, un the state of being unconverted and this one being converted? Does that make sense? All yeah. right. I'm sorry, I hope, was anyone writing that down or anything? I, so it's quick to erase. Okay. So where are we? We are born Correct me if I read this already. So, we are born human on the inside and human on the outside. In heaven, we will look like divinity on the inside and divinity on the outside. Yes, I did read this. So, does that make sense? All right. So, we're going to go on to focusing on sentence number two. So prior to, we said that sentence number two wasn't, was just noise. But now that we're focusing in on it, it actually becomes important to us. So in sentence number two of paragraph one, yeah, in sentence number two paragraph, of paragraph one in the book Christ Object Lessons, Ellen G. White is going to do a repeat and enlarge. In the first sentence, she's talking about Teaching as life, teaching and life, or in other words, teaching and mission, are all a parable. Okay, so I'm going to write sentence number two up here. So that we might become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. Okay. So this sentence begins with originally that we. But Elder Parmender included so, which doesn't take away from the sentence, it's just a part of English grammar, you know, to make something flow a lot more easier. So we're going to add the word so in front of that so that we might become, okay, it's starting. And then it's going to sound like so that we might become acquainted with his divine character, right? What I'm going to do, what you can do in English, is that you can flip this sentence. You can put this part of the sentence in front of this one, and it does not change the meaning of the sentence. Usually when someone puts a first thought, um, the first part of a sentence, it's because they want to express the importance of what 
they want to get across to you first so that you're focusing on this and not so much on this, okay? So if I were to take this and put it like this, I'm gonna reword it. Um, I'm gonna do that in a minute so you can see what I'm talking about. If I were to flip this sentence and put this one first and then this part last, it wouldn't do nothing it, it, to change the meaning. It just changed the orders of things and how it flows and how it sounds, okay? No, it's, it's just, no, it's just a, a grammar, an English grammar thing, okay? So it would look like, basically, Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. And you wouldn't need, no longer need the comma, actually. So that, because it's complete, this way, written this way. So that we might become acquainted with his divine character and life. Okay. What we're gonna focus on in this sentence is his divine Our nature, and our theme is going to be character and life, right? Okay. This is going to become noise. This is going to become noise, and that's going to become noise, and that's going to become noise. So overall, what we're going to come down to, this is all going to make sense in a minute, is our nature become acquainted with his divine character in life. So I, I'm going to ask a question. What's another way of saying our nature? OK. Humanity. Thank you. Humanity. You were right, too. Not like that. But yeah, just OK. Humanity. And what about his divine? Divinity. OK. Character and life, what did we learn that is? His mission and his life is what? Parable. Good job. Parable. So what is this to the, to the first sentence? Can we see this? 
a repeat and enlarge. Can you see that? Amen. Okay. What is another term for repeat and enlarge? There's two you can say, repeat and enlarge. Good job. Line upon line and what else? Typology, right? Line upon line and typology. Okay. But the point is, is that another word for it is line upon line. So we see that sentence two is building on sentence one by repeating the same point in different words. Can we see that? Okay. It begins with that we. We're going to add so, which we did, in front of that, so that we might become acquainted with his divine character and this in life. And this is what our main um, understanding or the, the point, the theme of what God is wanting us to get out of that. So in the first sentence, Ellen White says Jesus is a parable whether he speaks or whether he just lives. Just in being, he is a parable. This is what God wants us to be today. We are also to be a parable. So we should be teaching in parables. Should we, talk, should we be talking to people about Jesus? Of course we should. What kind of Jesus should we be talking about? We should be talking about the parable man, the man that is hidden in the shadows, in the types, in the allegories or parables. You find this man everywhere in the Bible. His name might be Cyrus, Artaxerxes, Azuerus. It could be many different people. Christ is found in many stories. It could be Boaz, and it can be you. Living epistles, right? When we start studying, we need to start studying in this approach to start seeing things that, we are, that are not so easy to see. This is not an easy task. Many of us are not experienced, right? We need to grow up and start becoming spiritually mature. That takes effort. If we're not taxing our energies and our brain doesn't hurt in the study of God's word, and if we're not confused and complex, that should indicate that our studies are headed in the wrong direction. It's in the direction of, apost of apostate Protestant Protestantism, sorry, which is cheap grace, the story of salvation that is not real. It's like living in, in the model of human and human and thinking that you're going to understand heaven and get there. We will never do that. You will never in this condition think that you can get to heaven and remain there, right? Well, some people do, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, you might think it. Exactly, but that's not going to happen. That's cheap grace. Any comments, questions? Okay. So is Jesus a parable in heaven today? Yes. Yes. He is not all human, nor is he all divine, but he is a combination of the two. So by definition, he must be. He retained his humanity when he went to heaven. This is so because when we get to heaven, we will still have this humanity. Even though it will be glorified, it will still be human. We will be in this state, but it will still be human. I was talking to somebody about when we get to heaven, are we going to be like angels? But here it says we're still going to have humanity. Mm -hmm. So maybe we're not going to be exactly like the angels. I don't think so. We will have the robes of righteousness like them, and we will be able to fly, so we'll be something like them. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, God created us different, right? He created us in his image, and he different from how he created the angels. Not saying that there's any favor or, you know, right. real true difference, but there is difference there. Okay. okay. 
In the first sentence of the book, Christ's Object Lessons, it is going to be understood that parable is connected to both the teaching, also word, and the mission, also we can say life. In other words, parable teaching is the same or equal to the parable life. The principle which is parable is seen in the life. Substitute the word principle for parable and you get the parable teaching is the parable life. Okay. Amen. So we already kind of went over um, this next slide. I got ahead of myself there. But I do want to mention this, that acquainted means familiar. In other words, that we might become familiar with his divine life. What's his divine life? It's his character, his Divine life and character are the same, right? Where is character? It's not in your fingers or in your feet. Where is your character? Amen. It's right here. It's the same. It's all the same. Remember? Mind equals heart equals character. equals what? You. That's the only thing we're going to be taking to heaven, people. We're going to have new bodies. Amen. So that we might understand what a divine mind is, what did Christ have to do? Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. If you take the words on their own, we begin to argue what nature did he take, the sinful or the sinless? Away with these arguments. They're not good arguments. The picture tells you, in order for us to understand his mind, what did he take? He took a human body, right? He took a human body. The nature refer, that he refers to here is self-defining, which is the rule which we can use as rule number, one, number five, sorry, of William Miller's rules of Bible interpretation, which states that the Bible needs to be its own expositor or own definer. So she's basi it's basically self-explanatory when you're talking about the, the nature in which he came, which is just the human body. We, when we start thinking about the nature of Christ, don't guess. Don't go to some other spirit of prophecy quote. Use the rules, principles, and laws, and the passage will tell you what the nature is. And we know that is self-evident because we've already done that multiple times now, right? We have practice with it. Christ has to take the nature that we have on the outside. He could have never taken the nature on the inside. If Christ were the same on the inside like you and I, why would the Bible say, let this mind be in you? It's because we could say it's already there. He has nothing to offer me. We will be left with no hope and no true salvation, right? Okay. So we're just going to briefly go through this, the rest of the paragraph, which says, Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory, and the, and the visible human form. Men could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God was made manifest in the likeness of men. So it was in Christ's teaching, the unknown was illustrated by the known, divine truths by the earthly things with which the people were most familiar. What does she do, what she does now, she is going to do a juxtaposition. 
Ellen White is talking about parables, and she is and she is structuring the first paragraph using all of these rules, compare and contrast, juxtaposition, natural and spiritual, repeats and enlarges, talks about Jesus. Everything you need to know about parables is in this first paragraph. So what is juxtapositioning again? Sister Christine? <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Uh, Justifying is placing two elements, two objects, two words, two ideas, two concepts side by side for the purpose of developing comparisons and contrasts, right? Okay. So we've read the first paragraph. I'm just going to highlight the words divinity and humanity, invisible glory and the visible human form. Let's pause here and look at this one before we continue. Can you see my mind or my heart? Can you see that? No. The mind and heart is invisible. The condition of the invisible mind and heart is glory. The glory on the inside cannot be seen. The invisible glory is in the visible human form. The visible human form is the outside, the human body. What does that sound like? This one right here. And who do we know perfectly represented this? Christ. Amen. This is a repeat and enlarge of what the second sentence is teaching. We're using the repeat and enlarge technique to see how she reinforces this point over and over again. We proved it in the first sentence, reinforced it in the second, and now in the third. It says straight, divinity and humanity. Let's continue. The unknown and known, heavenly things and earthly, God and man, how easy it is to explain the nature of Christ. This paragraph is not even dealing with the nature of Christ. This is an introductory paragraph on parables. And we have done one of the most comprehensive studies on the nature of Christ, all together as a group. When Ellen White says God is, was manifest, seen in the likeness of man, it means that God was seen in man. This human body that we have is full of sin. It's sinful flesh. Divinity is not sinful. It's sinless. Christ was sinless in the inside. He was dwelling in a sinful body, and the tension between the two produced the what? The Messiah, the living parable. If we want to experience the same, that is what God is offering us, to be his counterpart. That means to be the same, to be identical with Christ. That's what we are supposed to be, copies of Christ. We do this by taking on, taking our human heart, sorry, we do this by taking our human heart out, the one we were born with, and having heart surgery, replace it with a divine heart. We have no power to do that work. Only Christ does. He is willing to offer us what he had. That is the gospel, and it is all found through parables. A comprehensive, advanced study on the nature of Christ and on the process of salvation is all unpackaged through parables. Divinity and humanity, invisible glory and the visible human form, the unknown and known, heavenly things and earthly things. God was manifested in the likeness of man. These five truths, which all come together, dealt with his life. In the last sentence of the first paragraph, it reads, So it was in Christ's teaching. Christ's teaching was the same as those five truths previously mentioned. Teaching referred to as the unknown and the known. Divine truths by earthly things. So she gives, us, so she gives two for the parables, right? So Ellen White has gone through this repeat and enlarge seven times. When you unpack a pack passage, it teaches us many things. 
So I want to note on something because this came up and I'm going to show you where that made me, that God impressed upon my mind as I went through this study or actually through that last portion we just read. Which I thought was so interesting. And I welcome any questions or comments here because this was pretty interesting. So when he refers to taking out the one we are born with and having heart surgery, surgery and replacing it with a divine heart, that made me think of another surgery way back in history. I won't ask, it's okay, because it would depend on my story. But we're talking about Adam and Eve, <laughs> right? And then we're going to talk about the end when I'm going to be referring to Christ and the 144,000. So we have the first surgery performed here. With the rib being taken out of Adam to create Eve. What does that look like over here? We kind of just talked about it. Conversion, right? The heart taken out. Mm -hmm. And receiving. I think I spelled that wrong. Uh, what? I'm for E except after C. What? Sorry, I'm having, yeah, I know. I was thinking about that. Okay, so receiving a new heart. Okay. Human heart. Well, yes. Same thing, okay. We know what I'm talking about here, hopefully. So yes, a heart taken from Christ to create a new human or his church, right? Just like the rib was taken out from Adam to create Eve, a new human. We have Adam and Eve together are complete. So when Adam and Eve are together, they are complete, right? And when we have Christ and his church together, I won't continue to write it down. We have it on the notes. When Adam and Eve are together, they are complete. So when Christ and his church are together, they are complete. The rib signifies what? What did the rib signify? That Eve. Amen. That Eve was to stand by Adam's side as equal to be loved and protected by him. So what does the new heart signify? It signifies revival. God gives us a part of himself. We become partakers of his mission, his character, his life, right? And then you have the known. Physical intimacy is, what, is how Adam knew his wife. And how are we to know God? His mind his heart, and his character. Any comments or questions on that? I thought that was so interesting and how God brought that out. Um, I mean, if someone wants to add input, I didn't go into really a, a deep study on that, but it's just something that was impressed upon my mind. I would like feedback if anyone has any. If not, in closing, this is just an introductory passage to a big book. Can you imagine what truths are in the second paragraph or in the third, the second chapter? It goes on and on. 
I want to inspire us. I want to encourage us to really study God's word with zeal, with the desire and with the belief that if we use the rules, he will give us in response great light. With great light comes great happiness and joy. With great joy, we have the assurance that God is with us. And if God is with us, who can be against us? Amen. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and allowing Christ to die for our sins and take on humanity. Something that if we remain faithful we and, and make it to be a part of your kingdom, Lord, we won't even have to be in, we'll have a divine body. We won't carry around these bodies, but Christ is going to be carrying around this human body. And that was such a great sacrifice. And we are so thankful, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would help us to be the living parable as Christ was, Lord, to be living epistles, to have the mind and heart of Christ in us. Though we have these human bodies, Lord, we pray that you would develop in us a character, the mind after Christ's likeness, that all those who see us may see a walking parable, Lord, that they may know you. And I just pray, God, that you would help us in the process of doing so. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.